All right, now we're good. Oh, about three. Okay, now we're good. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Show Me Con 2016. Very proud uh, to have Valerie Thomas up here. Uh, she is one of the most or the foremost physical security, uh, physical penetration testing experts that we have on hand here. Uh, she's run quite a few CTFs in the DEF CON space as well, correct? Okay, a couple few of those. Uh, but yeah, with great pleasure, Valerie Thomas, everyone. Thank you, sir. I don't know about foremost authority on anything. So, foremost, no, no foremost authority on anything. No, 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 no. <laughs> anyway, um, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, super quick intro here. Uh, I work for a smaller company out of DC called SecureCon. We're about uh, 65, 68 folks now. Uh, we do a lot of work in the SCADA space, uh, as well as federal and the commercial side. So. I spent a lot of my time in substations and wastewater treatment plants um, and federal buildings and everything in between. So pretty varied background, I guess you could say. So this talk is a, a newer one that I've put together um, kind of over the years for a couple of reasons. One of which is I'm from the IT security side, not the physical security side originally. But when I would go out and do a lot of the pen tests and on-site assessments, we would find a lot of these interesting devices that nobody really knew what they were. So once we started to look into them, it was, oh, wow, hmm, this says door controller. That sounds really important. Maybe we should figure out how this works. So um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about in this presentation today is a collection of things that I've seen in the field uh, as part of assessment work. Some of it's uh, more on the lab side, some independent research that I've been working on here and there. Uh, but it's really all from the IT security perspective. So um, this is not a, an as-is compliant uh, presentation. If you were expecting one of those, I, I do apologize. Um, I've broken all their bylaws, so I can't be a, a member of their organization. So we'll get right into it, because I have several slides and probably not enough time to get through them all. So what are physical access systems exactly anyway? So sounds pretty self-explanatory, right? We're basically allowing or disallowing access to a certain point. But why physical access? Well, it's, it's everywhere, right? So I don't know how many of you flew um, to come into town for the conference, but uh, if you walk through the airport here, there are many, many, many card readers throughout the St. Louis airport. So the next time you're around, uh, coming or going, highly recommend you start kind of looking around and looking for these things. You will be amazed at the places that you will find them. Uh, special interest for me, a lot of these access systems are in schools, uh, especially elementary schools. So I have young children, kind of interested in the system that's supposed to be protecting my children's school. So I know in the abstract I talk a little bit about card components and how we're going to look at the system holistically. So in order to do that, while we're not specifically going to focus on card vulnerabilities, I am going to talk about them because it really doesn't make sense to talk about that without including all of the other pieces as well. So we're going to look at cards, we're going to look at all the components so that you understand a little bit about um, each of the pieces that make up the system. Uh, from the IT side, you know, we don't really deal with these kind of systems all the time. So I thought I'd put a quick intro in there so that everybody has the same common terminology. So for our control access point, uh, that's obviously our, our stopping point, right? That's our decision point for where we want to either allow or deny access. Most places this is going to be some kind of door, some kind of gate, uh, turnstile, train stations, airports, things like that. Uh, credential reader. So I'm going to use the, the word credential and access card interchangeably a lot during this presentation. Uh, but I did want to mention that there, there's a, a very specific difference there. Um, although that data can be stored on cards or little key tags like these, it's the same credential data. It's the same identity that you're using despite whatever vehicle method you may choose. Our reader is really what's going to process our credential. So I'm trying to do these in the order of which you would use them. So we've got lots of different options when it comes to the credential readers and what you can use uh, as a credential or multiple credentials together. 
So you could use some kind of combination with an access card and a biometric reader. Um, you can use like the, the hand geometry things. Yeah, that doesn't really qualify as biometric. Um, in addition to, say, a PIN code. Some of our clients only use a PIN code. They, they don't have access cards or key fobs or anything like that. They have a randomly uh, generated six-digit code, and that is their entry identity into the building. Highly recommended that they change that. Hasn't changed yet. Okay, so a little bit about these cards. Uh, lots of you probably have them for work. Uh, I know that there is a decently sized uh, federal presence here. Um, this is not exactly the same way that the PIV card works or the CAC, uh, but the fundamental pieces of the proximity software are the same. So these also work with those little tags that you have on your keys where you use them for the gym or just random little doors like that. Uh, so inside of the card or the fob, we've got some copper wire that's all coiled up in there and a teeny tiny chip that uh, has our credential data on there. So for the most part, we, we basically have two pieces of information that qualify as our credential, one of which is going to be the facility code, which will pretty much be the same for whatever uh, organization you're, you're with, right? So, um, uh, so my company, you know, we use one facility code for all of our buildings um, pretty much across all town, right? So uh, most of the time you'll find this to be the same uh, with most organizations. It's very rare that an organization uses multiple uh, facility codes unless they've inherited buildings over the years and in which case they may have inherited the old software and readers that came with it so they kind of have to blend with the legacy devices. So we've got our, our facility code and we've got our access card number. So the card number is really what makes you you so that the system can uh, can verify that against your identity in the database. So the low frequency access cards, these are kind of legacy, but you're going to see these um, probably in about 80% of the deployments that are out there, uh, especially in places like, like fitness clubs and stuff like that. They're affordable, they're scalable, um, they're unencrypted, and they're easily clonable. So if anybody needs free parking or free fitness uh, memberships, see me later. Uh, the high frequency stuff is uh, a little bit more sophisticated. And it can hold a larger amount of data because it's going faster. So not going to get into too much signal analysis here. But if you look at the top, you know, this is the speed of which our low frequency card will send data. So when you present your card to the reader and the reader powers the little chip inside your card, this is the rate at which it sends that information. So it's sending the facility code and then it's sending your credential number as well. Um, now, a couple of seconds may not seem like a lot of time for you to stand there by the time it goes beep and then reads and processes that data. However, in really large, highly populated environments, um, things like train stations and whatnot, uh, you know, those, those seconds add up very, very quickly. When you're trying to move thousands of people in and out of a, an area during the day, um, you can't afford to spend a lot of time waiting for the system to process that data. So the high frequency cards kind of help out with that a lot because they send the data so much faster, as you can see here. Uh, same amount of data, just a whole lot faster. This also leaves us with a lot of extra space so we can put things in there like, I don't know, encryption. Pretty important for us security folks. So when our credential reader actually beep reads the card and transmits the data, it's sending the data to something called an access control panel. So the access control panel is just a tiny little, tiny little onboard kind of computer like guy. Um, these are embedded devices. They are not overly intelligent devices. Um, they, they don't respond well in enterprise environments. And this is also done over copper wire, right? So this is, this is not ethernet there. And that makes a big difference uh, later on in the architecture and why that is. So the control panel will decode this data. And sometimes, um, especially in some of the, the more legacy-based vendors, uh, they will actually scatter the access code and the card number uh, with some other numbers throughout. Now, being security people, we would think that that would be a, for security reasons. But on the physical access side, that's actually um, a vendor safety feature so that they can lock their clients into only purchasing card stock from them. So we all know how security by obscurity ends. That story never really ends very well. Um, so that's kind of what we're dealing with here on the physical access side. 
So we'll talk more about the access control panels later and why they matter so much. Um, finally, a piece of hardware that we'll recognize, the access control server. Right? This is usually like a, a 2008 box um, or equivalent. And that's really our, our brainchild of the entire operation. So that's where all of the records for the database and entry and who can access what door at what time, all of that is stored uh, in the, the software that sits on the, on the access server. All of that works together pretty well. Um, door components, just going to touch on them super light just because they, they do matter, um, but I'm, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail on them. So these are things that uh, control the monitoring and the open and the closing of the doors. So the electric strike is one of the ways that the physical access system can tell, uh, it can detect if the door is opened, um, either in an authorized way or what they call a force open. So if I use a crowbar and, and pry the door open, um, because that's a normally closed switch when it opens, um, that would trigger an alert on the physical access software that the door has been forced open. Now, just because it generates an alert does not mean that somebody is actually there to do anything about it, but it does generate an alert, which is largely ignored. Um, door contacts are very similar. Not going to get into those too much. Uh, request to exit. So this is one that you'll see uh, if you look at some of the documents about physical access. Uh, sometimes this is also called a Rex. So some slang terms in there. And I'll show you how this works here in a little bit. All right, so if we put that all in a picture, this is how our basic topology is going to work. Our little guy here, I call him Steve. He presents his, his card, in this case, to the reader. The card only gets power from the reader. So the card by itself is useless um, until it gets powered by something, not necessarily that reader. Uh, the reader will read the contents off of the chip of the card and send them on copper wire. Uh, it uses a protocol called WIGAND or WIGAND, depending on how you pronounce that, over to the access control panel. Uh, little access control panel kind of sits between, right? He's sort of like our firewall. He's got one leg on one side and one leg on the other. So access control panel uh, talks to our, our physical access server. Now these two don't always constantly communicate. So we'll, we'll get into why that matters a little bit later. Basic topology again. This is just another way of looking at it. Um, door controllers are normally limited to maybe a max if you buy all the expansion cards of eight, maybe 16 doors. So most office buildings have a whole lot more than that. So you kind of need a tiered architecture with these. Um, they are smart enough to, to understand like a, a master-slave relationship. You know, this is the master controller and then only the master controller will sync with the server and then it will disperse down to the other underlings. Um, that's really important in a pen test because we, we like the master controller a whole lot. So that's the quick, super quick overview of these are the basic components and how it works together. Um, now let's talk about why it doesn't really work that well and why it's broken. So I really like this slide um, for a couple of reasons. We in the security industry, IT and physical, tend to create pillars that, that divide us. Um, but at the end of the day, computer security and physical security people protect the same things. We are protecting the same data, we are protecting the same infrastructure, the same buildings, the same servers, whatever. But if you tell somebody that you work in computer security, you get the, wow, you must be really smart. And if you tell somebody that you work in physical security, you get the, aw, well, I'm sure that you'll finish school one day and get a better job. It's just how it works. And that's part of our, our cultural divide um, between the two. Uh, but the controls are really what are probably the biggest difference, I would say, um, and how they're implemented between the two groups. So on the IT security side, you've got you know, very heavy regulated things, uh, not that regulations are everything. That's a different talk, that's later today. That's not mine. Um, we've got compliance, we've got controls, we've got things that, that are implemented and measured and constantly reassessed. On the physical access side, usually when these systems are installed, they're done by a contractor like uh, like a data watch, data card, uh, Siemens, you know, whatever the local integrator is. Uh, they come in, they install it, they make sure all the cards work and everything swipes and everything talks and they leave. Right, they're done. So you know, they don't really have the equivalent of what we would call acceptance testing, uh, especially on the security side. So once it functions, the vendor's like, well, we're done. You all have fun with that. 
And as we know, uh, in the cybersecurity world, that really doesn't work so great. So while we kind of have this great divide between our two groups, um, the physical security components are heavily reliant on the network and the IT security components that the physical security folks don't necessarily um, fully understand. It's not their industry, it's not their specialty. Um, they are taught to rely on that system, um, but they don't necessarily understand how it works. And this is one of the things that we struggle with most uh, when we do physical assessments and we come back with identified findings. Um, so a while back I stopped writing up IT-related findings with the physical access system in the IT report. I started putting it in the physical report and making that the responsibility of the physical group. So of course, that doesn't go over well. They're like, wait, what are you, password, that's, that's IT, the computer guy handles that. Why is this my finding? Well, that, because it's your system, and that's your bad password, and, and this, is, this is bad for a couple of reasons. So there's a lot of re-education that, that we need to work on here, uh, be, to really to just get the two groups even just talking to each other. So a lot of what I do um, and the outbrief process and the reporting process uh, kind of involves playing the, the middle middleman here. Uh, one of a, the great examples about that, and I didn't make a slide for it, um, when these systems are set up, physical security people are usually the person, uh, head of physical security is going to be the one that's in charge of all of the paperwork and getting the approvals to get the system installed. So they read their deployment checklist for the software and they see that they need their own VLAN. So they go to the network person and they say, we need our own VLAN for, uh, I don't know, it says, you know, at least 200 IPs. Network guy's like, cool, here you go. Um, because nobody from computer security was involved, that's a routable VLAN to everywhere. So anybody on the corporate network can get to these systems. So when I identify that as a finding in the reports, it's the physical guys like, wait, no, we have, a, we have our own VLAN. You can't touch that. We have our own VLAN. I'm like, well, you know, here it is, uh, all of it. So then he drags in network guy, and network guy is like, well, you said you needed a VLAN. You didn't say you needed ACLs. Physical guy is like, what are ACLs? I don't, what are these? So, you know, we, we kind of have our pillars of responsibility, uh, especially within the enterprise, and we're really not doing a very good job of bringing them together and um, really looking at the system holistically. So I've been doing a whole lot of playing telephone, I call it, uh, and trying to work between the groups and trying to figure out a good way to get them to work together better. Oh, we already went through most of this. Um, probably the biggest key thing that I want to point out here is that physical security folks are very uh, vendor loyal. So on the computer security side, you know, we're not, we're not so um, loyal to our vendors. Um, you know, they make mistakes, we get different ones, we're unhappy, we get a different one, so on and so forth. We have a lot of options, we have a lot of choices. Um, on the physical side, they don't have as many options and as many choices. So once they find a vendor that they're comfortable with, they take whatever that vendor says as gospel. So trying to get um, some of that mentality to change is uh, very difficult and it's definitely gonna take a while. Um, they're not used to patching things. So when we identify vulnerabilities or updates that need applied, they just, they don't understand. And most of the time, their contract with the vendor does not um, support updates or configuration changes to the environment. So then they have a contract issue with their vendor. So it goes from bad to worse, really, at that point, because the vendor can almost hold them captive and tell them that they avoid the warranty or they'll avoid their terms of service if they make changes to the baseline environment. So we definitely have a, a whole lot of work to do on things that have nothing really to do with technical data at all which is what makes it difficult for folks like us. So one of the reasons why we shouldn't be vendor loyal, um, physical access vendors are, are still kind of behind the curve when it's compared to computer security vendors. Um, HID is a great example of this. So HID Global is the, the largest, largest name in physical access in the world, or something like that. I can't remember their marketing language. Anyway, a handful of years ago, they decided that, okay, the proximity card software, that, that's broken. You know, that access model is not working. We should come out with something better, and we should come out with something secure. I know. Let's encrypt everything. Sounded like a good idea. The only problem was they chose to roll their own crypto. 
So historically speaking, I don't know of any story where the vendor said, we're going to roll our own crypto that ends well. So they didn't bring in a cryptography expert. They used uh, in-house resources only. They didn't have it uh, verified by a third party. They thought, you know what, we'll just keep it super secret and everything will be fine because it's encrypted and nobody could ever figure out the key. Well, they figured out the key about, I don't know, six years ago. And not only did they figure out the key, they pulled it off of the reader and then published it and then um, brought it to HID, at which point HID said, this is not valid and we don't know what to tell you. That, that's not our key. Um, even though they could reproduce it and they could create cloned cards based on those keys, um, HID basically chose not to acknowledge it at that point. So their, their way of dealing with it was to just ignore it and hope that it went away. Luckily, since then, um, HID has had some, some changes uh, in senior management, so they are working on um, kind of catching up with the rest of us in the computer security world. Uh, they're, they're working on, they're not ready for a bug bounty yet. So please, please don't go out and try to do that with them. Um, but, but they are working on things like even just basic stuff like a vulnerability disclosure process. So they're, they're starting to catch up. Um, and this is the largest vendor in the physical access world. So that will kind of give you an idea of where the other ones who are not the largest are in regards to security and research. Okay, so let's talk about each of these pieces and what we can do to them because it's all about breaking stuff, right? So we're gonna go through card attacks a little bit quickly because a lot of this is not new material. It's been out there for a while. If you've done any kind of research on physical access systems and RFID hacking, I'm sure you've run into most of this. Uh, but I did wanna kinda of put it all together so that you'd have a nice reference. Proxmark 3 used to be the, the only gold standard when it came to RFID research. Um, it's very cool. It's a, it's a research tool. It's not for hacking, it's research. Um, very compact, it's about the size of a solid state drive. So, you know, it fits in my hand, but, but that's just the device. So you also need the antenna. So depending on if that's high or low frequency, the low frequency antenna is the size of a CD. And then you have to power it as well. So some of the guys on the team with like long arms could like tuck it in their inside coat pocket and run the antenna wire down their arm and kind of palm the antenna so that they could just try to get close to somebody on the street to get a good read. But I have short arms and that just, it just didn't work for me. The read range on that, because this is a research tool that's meant to be basically tethered to the computer all the time, is not very much, right? So trying to get this close to somebody's badge without them noticing is very awkward, even for a female. Just putting it out there. So my first attempt to deal with this was what I called the RFID binder of doom. So I basically held uh, all of the Proxmark 3 stuff together with some Velcro and modified this binder. Um, that's just a little cell phone battery pack up there on the top. Uh, it doesn't take much power, so you don't really need a big battery for it. Uh, antenna on the other side, you zip it all up and you can walk around with it on the street and just kind of like randomly, you know, kind of get close to somebody and maybe tap it a little bit when you need to get your card read. Um, unfortunately, the, the leather on the binder prevented a lot of the power from getting to the card. So while it tested okay at home, field testing did not, did not work so well. So phase two uh, of that was to use the grid it. So whoever come up, came up with a grid it was a very smart person. It's really designed to like hold all of your uh, adapters and little things that us Mac people have to carry around um, all together in the same place. You can just pull it out of your bag and all your stuff is right there. But it also is fantastic for holding all of the Proxmark 3 pieces in, in place where they belong. And this worked really well. So basically you take this setup and you drop it in like a laptop sleeve and then you can just kind of like swing it around when you're walking on the street and just kind of casually get close to somebody or bump them or to reach to shake their hand and then touch with the side. Um, again, it sort of worked, but, but not very well. Uh, not so much in the field. So a couple years ago, uh, the folks at Bishop Fox really kind of took things up a notch uh, when it came to long range RFID reading. So I've got two examples in here of long range RFID readers. And these designs basically are plug and play uh, with any reader that is WIGAND compatible. So some of the card um, formats do not support WIGAND. 
So it doesn't work on everything, but it works on probably 90% of the market share. So while you're going to spend some money on it, um, it's going to be decently uh, reusable, I guess is probably the best word for it. All right, the read range is great. So instead of a couple centimeters, you've got about two and a half to three feet reliably. It's so much easier to get within two and a half feet of somebody than two centimeters to get a badge read. And what that really means is I can take this device, put it in a messenger bag or a big lady purse or whatever, and just walk around without actually having to touch anybody and skim all of their car data in the process. I did not bring it with me. You can come talk to me. I don't have any of it here. I stopped bringing it because nobody would come up and talk to me after the presentation. Nobody would get within a three foot radius of me, so <laughs> so I decided just to stop bringing it. But I did give you guys some pictures so you can get a good look at it here. Um, basically it uses, a, these guys use their own board, uses Arduino, and it reads the data and then saves it all to that little micro SD on there. Which is fantastic because the, uh, the Proxmark 3 was very limited by the amount of storage space that it had. So this, as long as you have a decent sized uh, micro SD card, it will read and write card data all day long. Um, so this is what it looks like on the inside. Uh, it drains those batteries very, very quickly. So those batteries will maybe get you maybe two hours of reading time, maybe. Um, when you pull out that little micro SD card, you get back to your hotel room, your car, the closest Starbucks, wherever it is that you choose to set up your little command shop. Um, all the card data is dumped out, a nice little text file like that. And then at that point, you can use something like the Proxmark 3 or any basic uh, commercial tool to write your card from there. Um, the Proxmark 3 is fantastic for a lot of things. Uh, simplicity is not really one of its strong suits. So there are a lot of very basic uh, commercial card writers that are cheap that I would recommend using instead. Uh, reference link is in there for you. Uh, design 2, uh, the Ravenhead, a couple of guys presented this a few years ago at DerbyCon. Uh, very similar design. Uh, they use a whole lot of, uh, a lot of the Adafruit stuff, so it's very pluggable, which is fantastic, because if this breaks in the field, um, you can pretty much hit the closest fries, micro center, whatever, and get 90% of what you need to fix it um, on the fly. So it does the same thing, uh, reads and writes everything to that micro SD card. Uh, it also has a Bluetooth add-on, that little red um, rectangle there. You can sync that uh, with the app on your phone, Android and iPhone, so that you know if you have a positive read. So that's kind of useful because it also timestamps the read. So if I know that I got close to the security guard about 1 p.m., and I feel my phone buzz when I get kind of close to the security guard at 1 p.m., you know, that's going to be a badge that I'm going to want to reproduce and probably try first because it has the higher likelihood of working just about anywhere. Uh, so the timestamping is very important when you're doing red team work. That way you can kind of keep track of the higher value targets. Uh, I'll put the link in here for you guys for this too. Um, oh yeah, this also uses a external battery pack, which is so much better than buying dozens and dozens and dozens of AA batteries. You can also fly with it. You can carry this on the plane, by the way. Uh, I have done so several times. Um, but if you're going to buy one, make sure that it has the option for 12 volt output. So I put a reference link in here for you. Uh, that's a fantastic device. So if we go lower tech, right, because the one thing that the red team has really taught me is, you know, not all hacks have to be like really leap. Okay. So on the back of these ID cards, please do not pull your card out now and look. When we get to this part, everybody pulls it out and looks at it. Um, usually on the back of your ID card, you've got numbers along the bottom that look like this. So the, the shorter of the two, that's 60347, that's usually um, the card code, right? So that's your, that's your card number, your credential number. So that is your identity printed on your card. Uh, the longer number with a dash at the end is uh, the tracking number with the vendor, uh, some kind of order number, right? So if you call the vendor and you give them that order number, uh, you can get details about that order. Who'd have thought? Uh, so some of the social engineering attacks that we do in combination with physical assessments, we'll actually call people and tell them that we're from physical security and we need them to verify that number on the back of their card. And we'll get them to read the numbers off to us. Um, so that way we know we have a good starting point and some reference points for valid card numbers so that I can tell if the equipment is working properly when we're on site. 
And you'll be amazed at how many people will actually give you that card number, especially if you give them an incorrect one. Hi, Mr. Smith, I just wanted to verify that your card number is 88347 because we had a misread on the, the door this morning and I want to make sure that that's you and your card hasn't been compromised. Well, no, my card is 60347, not that. So, little social engineering tip in there. Uh, usually if you give folks misinformation, they'll be very quick to, uh, to correct you. And as if walking around with your permanent password printed on your ID card wasn't bad enough, um, they also printed on the ends of the box. So if you know where the uh, cards are kept in the office building, or you know some of the people that work in that office, uh, you've got some other opportunities, let's say, um, for social engineering that, that card range in the facility code. And it works just like a credit card number, right? So once you have the card number and the the facility code, you can just mass produce these cards. I can make a hundred of the same card and they'll all work. The system won't know the difference between them. Okay, so let's look at the reader itself. Um, for electronics folks, I always talk about things being fully potted uh, and anti-tamper tape being around the outside of the reader. That's so people like me don't walk up and yank it off of the wall. If you yank it off of the wall, remember, that's a copper connection on the other side of that. So it's very easy to just strip some of the wires that you need and put something in the middle of it, like the blee key. So a couple of folks came out with this two years ago at Black Hat. Uh, and this guy basically goes right in the middle, pops right on there. That's what those three spots are for, for the wires. And then you just shove it back on the wall, and uh, the reader will continue to function. But that's recording and storing on another micro SD card um, all of the card data that's going through that reader. Now what's cool about that is you can also sync it with your phone and it will sync with your phone um, the card data that it collects when you get within range. So I can get a big dump of the cards, which is very useful, so I can go back and you know manufacture those. But if I'm in a hurry and I really don't have time to make a card, I can wait until somebody uses the door, watch them go through, and then use the app on the phone to just tell it to replay the last thing that it recorded. And it, it will replay uh, the same card data. So you can get through the door without any card at all, just your phone. And really, I mean, how many people walk around tinkering on their phone all the time? I'm sure somebody will catch you eventually. Um, so got some links in there for you guys on that as well. Uh, it's pretty easy to create yourself. I think they're selling them too. All right, we are starting to run a little short on time, so I'm gonna pick it up just a little bit. So, Rex devices, I talked a little bit about request to exit. Um, that's usually something like this, a little motion sensor on the inside, that's usually on the inside of doors that look like that. Um, quick tip, uh, the top middle of those doors, you see those two big uh, gray dots? That means that those are magnetically controlled doors. So when the request to exit is tripped one way or another, it will uh, release the power to the magnet that's holding the door closed. So to do that, um, we use a really sophisticated device. Again, Red Team does not have to be very overcomplicated, but I like to use the we love our customers because I love putting it in the reports. They're not nearly as amused by it as I am, um, but I think it's great. Uh, all right, so we're gonna hope that my video clip works. So if you do this, you can literally just slide it between the door and pop it open like that. Yeah, right, and the little card reader beside you on the, on the wall, that's still red because it wasn't tripped from the outside, it was tripped from the inside. And because that request to exit device is unlock the door, that's normal for it, so it doesn't send that alarm to the, the system that nobody will see anyway. Uh, sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes they adjust that beam to be out further away from the door to prevent people like me from shoving coat hangers in the door and opening them. Instead of just buying a metal strip that covers up that spot there between the doors, you can get a metal strip that just covers all that for you. Uh, so when that happens, I turn to another high-tech solution. Uh, big animal balloons. All right, so we just slide that between the doors too. We get one of the hand pumps that you use for kids' birthday parties. It's very portable. It only takes a second. Uh, you blow it up till it's just about ready to pop and then you let it go. And then it goes like this and then the door trips and you hear the click and then the door opens. When that does not work, there is a large pile of balloons on the other side of the door <laughs> that you may not be able to clean up. So just be prepared if you're gonna use that trick that, that you may have to explain that later. 
I always tell them that the cleaning crew had a party, and I, I don't know what to tell them about that. Uh, so I had a client a handful of years ago. They got these cool grocery store style doors that went in and out of their data center so that, you know, if the guys were coming through with carts and things, they didn't have to worry about opening the door. They still had to swipe in and out, but they could, um, you know, not have to use their hands and pull the cart with the servers through or whatever. Um, but nobody ever thought to just maybe, I don't know, test it. So if you just give it a little shove without a card, you can just go right on in. They were not amused. <laughs> Um, and, and one of the reasons it's like that is, is for fire code. So, um, you know, that door has to fail open somehow. Uh, it has to freely open if the fire alarm goes off. Uh, we help them adjust that. There are better ways to make that happen and still be compliant and, and not let people just shove the door open on their way out. Uh, that did set off an alarm, by the way, that was not noticed. Who'd have thought? We even propped it open for a while, hoping that maybe somebody would come down and, and look, but Nobody showed up. It was not good. Okay, back to our access control panels, the teeny little mini computers that aren't very smart. Um, these guys basically have a local cached database of what's in the access control server, right? So they have all of the access lists. They know that I'm allowed to access the doors that are listed in group A at these certain times. And the controller is basically, um, because it, it uses everything on copper to communicate back and forth, um, to the uh, to the door release function, uh, it does that for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, is the, you know this environment cannot tolerate latency, so they use copper in this case because there's no network latency, uh, right? If you've got everything hardwired in. Um, one of the other reasons that they do that is for scalability. They don't have to. They don't run into as many issues with cable running. Um, so when we have multiple controllers tiered together like this, um, they talk to each other, but they talk to each other mostly now uh, via Ethernet instead of copper, but they also have the copper. So I'm not really sure why um, they decided to try to make these smarter, but like they made it way worse by, by adding Ethernet. So um, they, they've added Ethernet connectivity to these things, and it's not locked down. I know you're all very shocked. Um, so if you look at these things from the network side, um, they're so easy to find. Um, they have really, you know, peculiar names like door controller one, door controller two. Um, they usually have some kind of little web server on them. Uh, not, not a full web server, but, but a little something that's in there. FTP is usually there. Anonymous FTP is usually enabled. Um, a lot of vendors will use that for their backup and restore, uh, process, right? Um, it may or may not also use that anonymous FTP to back up and restore from the access control server. So, small little tip there. You might double check those credentials when you find that access control server, if there are any. Uh, SNMP, read and write, is usually enabled on this as well. Now, why aren't these things found usually, or why aren't they secured? Um, they're kind of fragile when it comes to scanning. Uh, some of them will, will not tolerate, like even a port scan very well. So what happens is, A, they're, they're routable to everybody because, you know, the VLAN conversation from earlier. Uh, B, uh, they're usually uh, added to the exclude list if the client is doing monthly vulnerability scanning. So like everybody forgets about them, right? It's almost like they're invisible on the network. They're there, but nobody's allowed to touch them, so they therefore don't exist. Um, a lot of these little web servers only work in Internet Explorer. So if you're out doing a pen test and, you know, your um, eyewitness that goes through and takes all the screenshots of all the web servers comes up with a blank page and it has a name like, I don't know, iStar or Lantronics or something like that, be sure that you um, pull up that, that Windows VM that you save for special occasions. This is worth the special occasion, okay? This is worth looking in Windows for. Um, because if you hit that web server in Internet Explorer, it's a very chatty little cafe. Uh, these are some of the things that they have open. Not going to get into that too much. Um, I will be happy to provide the slide deck to anybody who wants it so that you have it as a reference. Um, like I said, chatty little Cathy's once you find them. Because it has a cached copy of the database stored locally, um, it's not really protected locally. Um, so it'll tell you pretty much whatever you need to know. You just kind of got to know where, where to find it. So the iStar controllers, um, they're one of the more popular enterprise-level controllers uh, out there right now. Uh, they have 
a decently usable uh, web interface. So they love to tell you about their connection path, um, who they talk to, where they talk to, how they talk to each other. Um, they'll also tell you about the, the cluster that they're in, right? So they'll tell you who their master controller is um, and, and the, the order that it goes in to, to update, right? So the one that I'm at might be fourth down um, on the list. And that's okay, because now I know who the, the master controller of that is, because it told me. It's very helpful. Um, so, you know, the web interface is full of fantastic stuff. Um, all these great databases. Some of these you can just click in the web server. Some of them you have to get a little um, creative in the command line to get the data that you need. But again, just like credit cards, all I need are the card number and the facility code, and then I can just mass produce from there. Um, it will also give you group numbers. So if you're looking for a specific area of the building, like, I don't know, the data center that you would like to get into, um, you can use these but they're usually grouped by zone, um, so you might have to do a little, little extra reading on them to figure out which one is controlling which part of the building. Um, some of them are la labeled very obvious, so I don't really care if badge number 1275 belongs to Steve, Bill, or Sue. I only care that it opens the data center door when I present the card. Uh, so that's the way that we use this. So we'll grab a whole bunch of valid cards, we'll write them all, and then we'll literally just use them until one works. And it's also helpful because it tells you the last time that it um, read that card and the expiration date of the card. So you even know if that card's expired and not to waste your time with it. Very helpful little guys. I like them a lot. Um, Vertex is a tool that's used for hunting some of the lower end door controllers uh, by HID. Vertex controllers are, they're cheap. They're a couple hundred bucks. Um, they're used in more like, like small business. Uh, sometimes multi-tenant buildings will use them as well. Uh, so this tool will help you uh, find them and do some man-in-the-middle-like activities with them as well because they're also not smart about who they accept traffic from on the network. So there are a lot of replay attacks um, that are possible in the physical access world uh, if you know just where to look. Uh, the access server, our, our mothership, uh, not as easy to find usually because it hides usually in the server farm with all the other servers. Um, for reasons that I, I haven't quite understood yet, some people feel the need to name it physical access server. So, you know, do some DNS research if this is what you're looking for. Um, if you own a physical access server, do some DNS research and make sure it's not named physical access server or Secure 9000 or any of the popular ones. Um, I got you a list here of all the popular ones so you can look for yourself. And of course, we can't talk about fun things without talking about Shodan. So some of these are actually on the internet. Um, a lot of them are, actually, um, because a lot of them are managed by third-party vendors. So in order for these third-party vendors to access the systems, they don't want to be bothered with something like, I don't know, a VPN um, to get to this. So they'll just put it on the internet so that they can access it whenever they want. But it's OK. It's secured probably with a really bad password that hasn't been changed. So some of these keywords that I have in there, feel free to, to show Dan search and uh, explore on your own. Uh, let's see, once you're on the internal network, even if you're just looking around, um, physical access people tend to create a lot of tickets for things that they do, like replacing badges. So so-and-so's badge number blah 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 was bad. We destroyed it and replaced it with badge number blah blah blah. And they'll put this in like their open SharePoint site. So you don't necessarily have to even find door controllers or any of the packs or do any of the card skimming to find valid card numbers. So just be sure to check all of the, the resources on the internal network for card stuff. Okay, I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to get to the good part of the, the war story uh, before we wrap up here. So uh, long-term client, they are a um, critical infrastructure client, put it that way. Um, these folks, they have a, a very complex system. Uh, they do a lot of the, the stuff the way they're supposed to. Um, card system really wasn't as great as it should be, though, right? So with these folks, uh, we used one of the long-range readers. We used the I-class one, if you were wondering, because it's encrypted. Um, walked around, did a whole bunch of card skimming. Um, they got discounts at local restaurants if they presented their ID badge. 
So we just looked for the lanyards of the ID badges hanging off of people around lunchtime uh, and breakfast time around all their good spots. Collected a whole bunch. Um, we have some card printers in the office that are portable enough to put the back of the car and take with us. So once we had good ones, we just made printed copies, right? So it looks the same. And then we just needed to program it to be the same. So we watched um, basically the main entrance and we noticed that at four o'clock, everybody would go home, including the physical security guard for that entrance because visitors weren't allowed in after four o'clock, which was great. So we used the clone cards to get in through that entrance. The door was unlocked, you know, during business hours, you could access it, it was fine. Um, they did not have the tower for the guard's workstation in a cage, right? So it's just sitting on the floor. So we went a little old school because I thought it would be fun. A little hardware keylogger popped it in on there. Um, went ahead and just let it sit for a couple of days, grabbed all their keystrokes, grabbed all their logins for all their other systems like the cameras and stuff. Um, picked it up later uh, after 4 p.m. when nobody was around. Uh, made a whole bunch more cards. Now, when we collected the keystrokes, you know, we went through multiple shift changes, so we got multiple sets of valid domain credentials. But they also had enterprise wireless, which was great. Um, so all we needed were domain credentials for enterprise wireless. Now, back to why um, I'm getting the STFU sign, you guys can't see it. <laughs> So back to why physical access vendors are not security vendors, they decided that it would be too hard to click on the computer, so they made a mobile app for you to be able to go in and unlock doors and make changes to the physical access system. So you can grab that in the software store. Not that I'm, it's free. You can just grab it, Apple Store, uh, Google Play, whatever. Put it on your device, log in from the wireless network in the parking lot, and then you can just open whatever door you want. So technically, we didn't even need badges at that point. We just opened the door for the person who was walking all the way through, all the way into the data center and all the goodies from the parking lot. So we've got some problems, um, obviously. Uh, you know, and it's, it's not an easy fix. Some of the technology is easily fixed, but getting around the politics and the culture and everything else that comes along with it is going to take uh, some time. So I have been working on a uh, PAX security checklist uh, that will hopefully uh, serve as a guide to kind of cover all of the attack surfaces and things that you should look for in your environment. Uh, getting ready to release that pretty soon. Uh, it's not out quite yet. If you drop me an email, I'll put you on the list for when the draft comes out. Uh, it's definitely open for uh, recommendations as well. So uh, I have business cards. If you don't want to take pictures of my slides, that's cool. But uh, yes, I will certainly put you guys on the list, looking for input, looking for ideas. Again, I'm just a computer security person. I don't always see the whole physical picture. So looking for suggestions if you have them. I don't have any time for questions, but I will go hang out at the end there. And I'm going to STF you now before I get drug off stage. Thank you very much. Okay.